Hey Robot Makers, hope you're having a good day so far. So, do you want to know how to make a motion detection system that can log time of events that happen to a Google Sheet uh, using a Raspberry Pi W and if, then th uh, if this then that, which is a web service that we'll look at in a minute. So if that's the case, then this is the show for you. So my name's Kevin, come with me as we build robots, bring them to life with code and have a whole load of fun along the way. Okay, let's get over to our keynote and look at what this is all about. So yes, this is all about how we... Uh, use MicroPython to interact with a Google Sheet, which is really cool. I'm going to do that using this intermediary web service that's called If This Then That. If you've not heard of this before, then uh, we'll have a bit of a dive into it today. So yes, we're going to have a look at how all this hangs together. We're going to have a look at If This Then That. We're going to look at uh, some of the things you can do with it. We're going to look at how to wire it up and how not to blow up three Raspberry Pi Ws in the process. <laughs> Ask me how I know. Uh, and then we're going to look at how to use something called webhooks in MicroPython, which is a lot easier than it sounds. It sounds really complicated. It really isn't. And then we're going to have a bit of a demo. And if you're watching this live we'll have a bit of a Q&A session at the end as well uh, so stick around for that too okay um also on a bit of a bonus I'll show you some of the things I've been working on this week as well as a uh, 3d prints okay so let's have a look at what this is all about so yes if this then that what we're going to do is we're going to connect up a motion sensor these are really really cheap I've got one over on the overhead we'll have a look at that in a second they cost about three pounds something like that and they look like uh, this little module just here we're going to connect that up to a Raspberry Pi W using the correct pins and then we're going to use some MicroPython code to uh, detect if there is any motion using this little sensor. So easy to uh, to get this work. You simply just detect is it high or low, is it a 1 or a 0. Um, so we're going to write some bit of MicroPython to, to uh, interact with that. We're going to connect to our local Wi-Fi network hotspot using some MicroPython and then we're going to send on every single event uh, when, when we detect motion, we're going to send that event up to if this then that. If this then that is then going to send that on to Google Sheets and Google Sheets is going to log a new entry every single time an event fires. So that's what we're going to do today. If that sounds like a good idea then stick around. Okay so uh, if this then that you might have heard of this before I use this an awful lot uh, to automate all kinds of things so when I go live um, there's a little if this then that uh, script that will run and or applet as they call it and that will notify my discord group for example the discord server get a little beep boop and it'll say new video has gone live uh, I've got all kinds of other things like that as well that work in the background too so it's a cloud-based service uh, for connecting things together uh, it has literally hundreds of apps I can tell you how I know this because I try to screen grab every single one of them and put them on like a graphic and there's like way over 700 of these things way way over uh, all popular brands that you'll probably know as well so for example Spotify or um, Hue Lights or um, all the virtual assistants you can connect to them we're going to be using Google's Google Sheet connector today uh, and it couldn't be simpler um, so we're going to trigger some events. So events can be triggered from many different sources. We're going to build our own custom event, which is what we use the webhooks for. And then we can just plug that into the rest of the ecosystem of if, then, if this then that. And it literally couldn't be simpler. I'll show you how, how easy this is. And um, actions can then be triggered based on those events. And you can define what happens or how many different uh, events can happen. Uh, and now I actually tried to replicate this in Node-RED just to see how easy it would be in Node-RED because maybe you don't want to use a web-based service, you want to do everything sort of locally. And I had to stop because I ran out of time because it was that fiddly. So you can do it in Node-RED, it's just really hellish. Well, if we have time, we'll have a look at that as well. And uh, they do have paid plans, they do have a free plan, which is more than good enough for getting started. So. So the free plan on the left hand side there is zero, always will be zero, and they allow you to have five applets, so five different webhooks uh, for different applications. Uh, it's free. The actual paid one isn't very expensive at all. I mean, the absolutely top top of the range um, Pro Plus is only $5 a month, so it's like the price of a coffee a month. That's not bad. I use the middle one, which is the uh, $2.5 per month. Um, it's like less than £2 or something UK. It's really, really cheap. And it means I can have 20 applets running uh, and the, they actually run faster. It just means the latency between the event happening and then them reacting to it is a bit quicker. Whereas on the free one, it's probably good enough for what you're doing. So um, no problem with anybody using the free one. I would try that uh, if you like it. 
you can move up to one of the uh, the other plans and there's no commitment you can always just sort of downgrade and this is in no way sponsored at all this is just a really great piece of software that i like now there are other pieces of software like this um out there um zapier is one of them that i've used before uh, but i like this if this then that it's very simple to get working and they've got more than enough uh, connectivity uh, and the way they, they make that work in the back end is just so seamless honestly it was just like a couple of clicks to get this working so how it works then so you've got these things we create a new app and we'll, we'll have a play with this in a second we'll actually create an app ourselves we create a new app and then we choose a trigger there's loads of different triggers available uh, and that could be like you know you've got a new subscriber or you know there's a, an update to a spotify um i don't know i keep using that one it's just the one that comes to mind a playlist or a new artist releases a single whatever the event is you can then have that trigger something on the Pro Plus only, you can then set queries or filters. I've actually never needed to use these, but um, you could you could check for things like um, you know, what time of day is this running at. Um, you could filter down the types of event, for example, but again, I've never needed to use this. Um, mine are usually quite simple kinds of uh, triggers and actions. Then there's the actions, and um, you can then say do a particular thing based on this event happening, and you can add as many other actions as you like after that as well, or in addition to that. So very, very simple uh, to get working. It could not be simpler. And the interface is just it's just about as simple as an interface could be. So this is the graphic I was talking about. This is about a third of the different applications, and I thought if I put any more on here, you probably wouldn't even be able to recognize exactly what these things are. So if we have a quick look... Uh, we've got like Adobe there, um, Air Cloud is that. We have um, Air Table. We've got down here, I can see Evernote. What else we've got on here? I know Spotify is on there. We've talked about that one already. There's all kinds of boxes on there. All of the things are on here. Even my air conditioner manufacturer has an app on here, so I could trigger that based on whatever I want, whether it's like a particular temperature range is reached, you could trigger that. Time of day somebody presses a button um one of the things i was working on i've actually did i bring it in yes i've got a whole bunch of these old um amazon buttons and like there'd be like a product name on there and you press the button it'll flash for a couple of seconds go solid and then it will go off and essentially all that is is what we're creating now it's like a device that connects to your local wi-fi detects that a button's been pressed sends an event somewhere and then as far as it's concerned it's done with it and that event might be order some more toilet roll or whatever it was that that particular device uh, had the button for i've got an absolute ton of these and google uh, sorry amazon don't actually even support these anymore so i think we can probably hack these and do something with them they're really small form factor in fact they're actually smaller than a, a peak code just about actually or maybe not maybe we could make one hmm there's an idea for a future project anyway i digress you get the idea there is hundreds of brands of connectors in there and there might be several different connectors or um, applets within each brand so there's just lots to choose from really sending emails sending text messages you name it it can do it so let's have a bit of a demo of this so i'm just going to uh, bring up my browser so just let me go back to me for a second while i bring up a, a browser and i'll just load up if this then that and uh, let's go over to it. Here we are. Right. So this is the, the website for If This Then That's. I've logged in. Um, so if you don't log in, I think you just get a different screen up. Uh, but we can have a look at like what applets I've created. Um, so take a note, send it to a Google Assistant. Are these the ones I've created? No, I think these are just uh, example ones. Um, and then there's like there's one that says like mine, my services. Uh, a lot of these companies I've literally never heard of. Uh, but it's great that they have connectivity in there. Right, so let's create one. So I'm just gonna click on the big create button here. Now, how easy is this as a user interface? If this, then that. So we click on the add button and say we want to um, create an event when somebody does something in YouTube. So if I go over to just type U, I can then bring up the YouTube triggers. So if, let's have a look. Um, so there we go, if a new subscription is, um, somebody subscribes to the channel and they've got their subscriptions set to public then i'll get um notification of this let's just do uh, my channel name on there and then we just click that and then we can then say okay if that happens then what do we want to do so i'm just going to do sms i'm going to make this uh, do it an sms text message uh, was it text message or is it sms i've signed up for one of these i think it might be click send uh, yep, make it send that, connect that, and then if there is any kind of account that you need to connect to, it'll bring up the little box there for you to do that with. Um, 
can't remember if I've signed up for this one or not. Don't think I have, so I'm just going to back out of that, back out and change that, uh, that action for a different one. Let's try... I can't see the one I was playing with before. Uh, let's say, well, let's just make it uh, make a Discord thing happen instead. We can just uh, play around with some trigger there. So I'll post a message to a channel. So let me wait for that to populate. Did I press that too soon then? Anyway, you get the idea there. I'm not doing a very good example here. I'm at, uh, let me try one last thing we can do. Well, I'll tell you what, let's do the Google Sheet thing. So Google Sheets, uh, which is just here where I'm just in the way of, we are gonna add a row to a spreadsheet. So it already knows about my account because I've already set that up. Um, we can give this um, spreadsheet a name. So we could call it, for example, subscriptions. And if it doesn't exist, it will create it, which is a really nice feature. And it says that it add ingredients, which is quite funny. So this is what it will add as a row. So if we want to add extra things, we can have a look what else we've got on there. So maybe we've got the title. So let's add in the description uh, instead. Let's click on that description. Okay. And then it's going to then save it to a particular folder path. That's in my Google, my Google Drive. And then that's it. We'll click create that's it done and um, i can even click like receive a notification when this actually happens so if anybody subscribes uh, what it will do is it will add this to my google drive um, into that particular location so let me just go back to me for a second i'll just pull up my google drive so if i just do drive.google.com i think it is and then i shall go into that folder and i shall share my screen again with you okay so there we go Right, so if I go back over here, you can see this is Maker Webhooks, and this is the spreadsheet that's going to be updated uh, that I've created on a different uh, demo, which is the one that we're going to use today. Uh, and what's going to happen is every time we have a new event, it's going to log in there. You can see when I was just doing a bit of a demo beforehand on the show, it's been logging different events there. Now, I've not been passing any actual data to this, so it's just got these blank values there, but we've got motion detected and we've got a time, uh, and that's being triggered by... Um, the if this then that so if I go back now to my applets um, we can have a look at what I've got on here so um, there we go motion detection one this is the one that's actually running at the moment um, there, I thought it, I thought there was an SMS text message element to that so there we go so if we want to edit that we can just um, go into it um, let's go into that and webhooks, it says on here, these allow you to integrate to other services on if this than that using your own DIY projects, which is exactly what we want to do. Um, I'm going to show you the details in a second, but I don't want to share my um, API keys with everyone in the whole world because it means I'll have to sort of destroy them and start again. Uh, but I'll do that very carefully in a second. So that's how we create them. And they just work. It's a really great uh, bit of software. Now, if I go over to my mobile phone, uh, I think there is an if this then that um, app as well, which is simply just a wrapper for um, for the web page. And I can see there the uh, the one that we just created a couple of seconds ago. Uh, and if I just say receive notifications, I can check if there's been any activity on there, and uh, it'll tell me if there's any problems with that as well. So it was saying that the Apple had failed, but it's actually switched on now, so it's all good. And um, yeah, that's as simple. So you can create them for your mobile phone. Um, the, the, the complicated bit is actually creating the code to do our DIY stuff, but that's what we're going to do in a second. So before we do that, I just want to show you... Oh, actually, it's on the slides. I don't need to do that. So if we go back now to um, back on the slides, I can show you exactly how we get this working. Okay, so wiring you up, these are the, the, the uh, PIR sensors, um, passive infrared sensors, and they detect motion. A lot of house uh, alarm systems use these. They're, they're quite ubiquitous. You'll probably recognize that sort of dome shape uh, transparent thing there and what that does is it just creates some angular faces so that detect motion could be detected from all different angles just using essentially one infrared um, beam it's very very simple so I got this one from the pie hut I think and they're about three pounds to buy very very cheap um, and they only have three pins so that first pin there is what made me blow up um, all my Pico W's I think I've destroyed three of them 
you shouldn't connect it to the 5 volt rail because what will happen is when it sends the signal it will send 5 volts back to the Pico and the Pico is only 3.3 volts so what we actually want to do is use 3.3 volts on the Pico I've updated the uh, the wiring diagram on the next slide so that you can learn from my mistakes and save yourself about 18 pounds of damage there um, so very very simple to wire up ground 5 volts or 3.3 volts which is what it should be and the signal and the signal pin simply goes high it presents as a 1 on the pico if we read that pin uh, very very easy to detect motion and as often as we want to sort of ping it we'll get uh, notifications back so I'm saying there it's 5 volts it's 3.3 volts and if you pick the fifth pin there that's the 3.3 volts out um, doesn't it's not a very high current high draw on that so it's fine to use that on your pico but what I was actually doing is connecting it to this top pin absolutely do not do that uh, that's like pure 5 volts and all that does is it goes back into here and this squirts it back out and then just damages that first pin probably damages the pico itself i couldn't these are just like toast now um, i'm going to try and revive them if i can but um, they may well be just dead now so that's how we uh, wire it up very very straightforward uh, not a lot going on there and i just used uh, simple dupont cables to do this as well so if you like what I do and um, you've not already subscribed to the channel, now is your time to help me out. Give me a like. They're free. Um, drop me a comment. Tell me if this is something that you're interested in. Have you used If This Than That? Do you use Zapier or what other automation software do you use, if any? And um, yeah, make sure you click the bell to uh, get notified whenever new videos come out. And I do go live every single Sunday at 7 o'clock-ish, which means it's either 7 o'clock GMT, whatever our local time is, we have daylight savings as well. So I think it's the end of October, did somebody say the other week? Um, I can't remember. But we're currently in British summertime, so it's GMT plus one until the end of uh, daylight savings. Okay. So webhooks, what are these all about? It sounds like a really complicated thing, and it really couldn't be simpler. So a webhook... Um, a, you can use webhooks to automate messages sending from an app uh, when something happens. Uh, they have a message or a payload and they are sent to a unique URL. This is why I didn't want to share out what my unique URLs are because you could just use them yourselves and um, pretend that there's motion happening and you know the world would just end wouldn't it. Um, so we can create with this unique URL um, we can create these triggers. So whenever we send a message to one of these URLs, we, we actually fire a post event or a get event to these, depending if we have a payload or not. So if we if you use the HTTP get, that's what browsers do to get a page off a server and bring it back. And if they don't need to send any data, get is quite simple. If you need to send some kind of um, information with that, maybe you're filling out a form, use a post and that contains the sort of payload of stuff. So depending whether we need to sort of send data with it or not, we can use just to get or if it's just an event, or we can use a payload to send like what the temperature value was or what the light levels were or what, which room this was detected in, for example, if we had many of these connected. But I've just got one, so we don't need to use post. We're just going to use get, which is nice and simple. Um, so we keep this URL secret because, like I said, anybody that has this can then use that. Um, so it's quite a poor security model, I would say, because... Um, security through obscurity is not great, but these URLs are so long and so complex that the idea is that nobody would ever get, nobody would ever guess one by accident. There is more URLs, um, more codes within these URLs than there are like grains of sand in the universe. That's how many there are. So it should be safe as long as you don't tell anyone or accidentally show people on a screen. <laughs> so. Let's wait for that to come back. And um, yes, this is how we do it in MicroPython. So very, very simple. This is the screen that you'll get when you go into the documentation screen on um, if this, then that. Uh, so it'll say to trigger an event, you need an arbitrary JSON payload. You can use the post or get request uh, and you'd simply send the post or get request to this URL. So maker.ifthisthenthat.com slash trigger slash the event name. And that's the thing that we type in when we create the event. Um, and I've just called this motion detected uh, slash JSON slash with slash key and then the key that they provide on this screen. So I've simply just taken this entire URL and I put this into a Python file and um, I've just saved that as something like key.py so you don't see it on the screen there. And I can also put it into my GitHub um, ignore file so it doesn't upload it accidentally to the web as well. Um, Note the extra JSON path element is a uh, in this particular trigger so if you send a json payload you include that as well and uh, with it says within the json body for example this is some test data and you can see there how that's all made up 
Okay, so let's go over to the next slide. There we go. So um, this is what it looks like as actual code. So we're going to use send event. I'm going to say the event name is motion underscore detected. That's what I called it in this if this then that. And then I'm saying the URL equals. And this F string means that we can replace parts of this URL with things within them curly brackets and curly braces. So event name, which is here, motion detected will get uh, exchanged, will be sort of string will uh, replace that with motion detected. And then similarly, the key, we're going to import that as a Python variable and replace whatever's in key, which is that really long URL thing. Well, hash. And then we simply do you request URL. Now you request may or may not be installed on your MicroPython. And we can install this using something called upip. If you've ever played around with Python, you can use pip, which is the Python package manager to install things which are not currently in your Python environment. And we can do this on MicroPython too. So we'll have a play with that. Uh, let me go over to Python and let's uh, have a quick look at that. So if I go over here and just make sure we've got um, a good environment, there we go. So we simply do pip.install and then the name of the module that we want to uh, install. So let me just find this up here. So you requests. I think it's as simple as that, is it? And it's saying pip can't be can't be found because it's u pip. That's why. Um, let's just do import u pip, and then let's try that one again. There we go. So what it's doing is it's actually installing that u requests into our Python library area on here. So what it will do, it's just downloading it. If we just hit the refresh on here. You'll see that there's like a new library folder that's been created and there's a new requests folder that's uh, sorry file that's been pulled down from the internet from uh, from the pip library from pypy um, so that's a really really easy way to grab the new uh, requests if that isn't included there so i think it actually was already so we can probably delete that if i just go over to here and delete that i think it does work without that so let me just uh, delete that away we go okay so what we'll do, we'll get back to our slides and then we'll come um, to the demo in a second. It's probably not far off, to be honest. So, yep, you request.post, we post that URL and then that's it. It's as simple as that. And we just print to the uh, terminal event sent. So very, very simple to get this up and running. Yep, it's demo time. So let's have a look at the full code, shall we? Right. So what I'm going to do, um, I'm going to go over to just here for a second, just to show you what's going on. Let me just arrange my screen a bit better. And let me just bring this down. Okay. So what I've got over here, <laughs> these are all the uh, Pico W's that I managed to uh, stop working by accidentally plugging in the five volt um, pin to this sensor. And then it just basically firing it back. The other things I've got on the desk here, this is um, a little project I did during the week. This is a next cube. So that's the back of the cube. And then the front there is where the, uh, the the disk drive would be. I think they have like a floppy disk and a, I don't know if that's like a CD-ROM or something. But it's like a really small cube. And the idea is that this can fit over the Pico in there. And there's like a little little um, notch at the back for the, ca the cable to go on. But it makes like a really nice little desk thing and little case for your, your Pico to live in. So that was something I was uh, playing with earlier in the week. Okay, so let's get over to the code. And let me show you what's going on here. So um, this is in the... Uh, Pico underscore motion underscore underscore sensor. If you go to uh, github.com uh, slash Kevin McAleer and then Pico W motion score motion sensor, you'll find this code as well. So we've got a couple of files. Key.py is my secret URL that I don't want to share with you, but that's the one that we get given by um, if this then that. We have a readme file. We have a secrets.py. Secrets.py contains two variables, one that's called SID and one that's called password. The SSID is your Wi-Fi hotspot name and the password is your Wi-Fi password. Again, it's not something we want to share with the world, so I've included them in the, uh, the .gitignore file. And then we have motion sensor. So motion sensor is the, the program that we're going to run today. So the first thing we import is network. That's going to allow us to connect to the Wi-Fi. We import the secret the secrets the ssid and the password we import the url key which is also the uh, secret one we import sleep from time library because we want to make this uh, pause for an amount of time because how long do we want to detect motion for do we want like every second or do we want it to sort of monitor and just occasionally check every five seconds or something depends how granular we want to be with that 
we import this u requests and this is the request library the u at the front just means it's like a micro python um, library i included this uh, garbage collect thing just because i was having some quirky things happen and that might more be to do with the micro python build that i'm using which is quite experimental i think still and um, this is where we do the bit where we connect to our Wi-Fi network. So we create a new variable called WLAN. We do network.wlan network.station interface. So that basically just says create a new variable with basically a wireless LAN thing. We then make that active true. And then we then connect to it using our SSID and password that we got from our file up above. Then we, what we then say is while we've not connected to the wireless LAN, so while not WLAN is connected, just print a dot the end means print it all on the same line rather than printing them light on new lines and then sleep for half a second and what that will do is it'll just create a dot 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 uh, until it's connected so once it's connected we can then set up our motion sensor so this is currently connected to pin one which is uh here if i just move that black cable out of the way you can probably just about see um, the yellow thing there is connected in fact if i just bring this zoom in a little bit you might be able to see it a bit better there. So we have, uh, yeah, that very top pin there is pin one because I've got this flipped over. Okay, so that's how we uh, set it up. It's uh, an input pin and it's just on pin zero. So that's that. We print connected to Wi Fi. My IP address is and then WLAN if config, which is interface config, and then the square bracket zero. It just means just give me the first uh, item in that list which is the IP address there's like four things I think you have your network mask your default router and the default gateway um, we don't really care about that then we've got that block of code that we looked at before which is the send event so we create an event name that's the same name that we create in our if this then that uh, we have the magic URL and by using these uh, curly braces and the, an F string we can make it a lot easier to change these things out. So if at any point in the future I, knew I have a new key or I change the event name, this URL string will just dynamically update as we change the event name or the key in the other file. Then we post that to that URL and then we just say event sent and that's it. So the detection window is just how many seconds do we want to wait before checking if there's any more motion. So I'm currently doing it every second. And then we have a while true loop that says if motion sensor dot value equals one, as in that there is some motion sensed, then print motion detected and send the event. Otherwise, print no motion and don't do anything else. I put this in here before just to test that um, both conditions were working. And then we just say sleep for the detection window, which is just one second. And that's the code right so let's uh, let's say stop there to make sure we've got a nice new uh, micro python instance running we're going to click run the current script and let's see what's happening so it's connected to my wi-fi that was quick no motion and if i put my hand let me just zoom back a little bit if i put my hand in front or near that sensor you can see it says motion sensed motion detect and it fired an event. So if we now go over to um, that spreadsheet, in fact, I might be able to pull it up on the bottom of the screen there. Yep, uh, a new instance actually occurred. So let's bring that down there. Let's uh, move this up so that we can see what's going on. And I'm gonna just get to the bottom there. Right, so if I put my hand in front of it again, we should get a motion detected event. And you can see there it's now logged another entry. It's not logging seconds, which is a bit frustrating because it means I have to wait an entire minute uh, to see which ones are different. But you can see that as I put my hand in front, we're getting new events triggering on there. So that uh, row 20 feet, 23 will trigger in a second, if all being well. Um, so let me just go back on here. Now, I have had this a few times um, where it says uh, error like it's a memory error. Uh, and I'm not sure what's actually triggering that. It seems to be something in new requests. Um, it seems to me either making it run out of memory. Uh, and I don't know whether that's because um, in my loop here, we're just saying send event if there is an event. Um, but once that uh, has been run, it, it clears up its memory. So there's not nothing hanging around or memory leaks going on. So I'm not sure if that's just a bug in MicroPython in the new requests or what. But um, when we when we put our hand in front there we get motion detected and we go back over to our spreadsheet we can see that we're getting more and more values appearing so there you go that extra one appeared in there so it's as simple as that that's how we can make this whole thing work uh, 
works quite well. I think what I need to do is build like a little 3D printed enclosure with the uh, the Pico W and maybe have something like the, um, looking around to see if I can see it now, um, the Amigo Pro and uh, a you know, gallium battery, that kind of thing, just to make this so that it'll work um, wirelessly um, for an amount of time. I don't know how long it would last on a battery though, um, probably a couple of hours. I don't think it would last more than a, uh, a couple of hours actually. Okay, so let's go back over to our keynote and um, see what else we've got on here. So yes, I wanted to cover off a couple of other builds as well. So if you've got any other questions about uh, that uh, Google Sheet thing, let me know in the chat and I'll tell you about some of the other 3D print builds I've done this week. So you've just seen the uh, the next cube, which I've got next to me here, which is a really, really cute build. Didn't take long to do this at all because it's quite just like a, a thin cube to print. Uh, I actually print it upside down like that so that um, you get like a nice smooth surface on the top and no uh, supports required underneath. And there is no extra supports required. Everything is designed. The little standoffs in here, which um, the case, the bottom case rests on, they're printed at a 45 degree angle so that it doesn't need supports as well. So really, really quick to print that. So I also built a Atari six, uh, 2600 VCS video computer system and uh, it looks absolutely amazing. I've got it actually in the back of my room over here. If I just go back over to, in fact, I can probably show you with my other camera. I go to this one here. You can just about see the back of the room there if I point. There it is. Uh, that is, my room's an absolute mess I'm afraid on here. Um, that's just sat on the top of the uh, the little cluster of Raspberry Pis I've got there. I've got two clusters. We have one that's running Clustered Pi just there, and that's running the uh, um, all the Clustered Pi and Kev's Robot web pages. And then we've just got this other little test one here that I use. But yeah, that's where the VCS one is uh, sat on top, and it's a really fun build to do. So I bought some um, some tape. Have I got it in here actually? Yes, I bought some wood grain effect tape um, to go on the front of the. Uh, the VCS because that's one of its sort of iconic looks. I printed that as a separate piece and then the the bottom piece is just kind of like um, a, a cradle kind of shape, a bit like a bed shape and then the Raspberry Pi compute module IO dev board sits in there so you can just screw it in with a couple of, um, I love these little M2 uh, screw nuts got an absolute load of these and they're the perfect size for screwing into anything that's Raspberry Pi related they all have uh, M2 sized holes in them so it's really secure attaches that Raspberry Pi compute module IO dev board base to the uh, to the bottom of the print and then the top piece um, which you can see just here um, this whole piece just sits on top there's no sort of uh, connection screws or anything like that so I, I just used some um, orange colored um, acrylic paint to give that um, iconic look there there's a paper-based print insert I think I had one print out before essentially just printed out a piece of paper that says like you know video computer system and has all the different um, uh, switch options on them cut that out cut that out very much like this one here <laughs> with little gaps in it for the little on off switches they don't move at all they're completely fixed uh, but it just makes it look the part and that covers and contains the Raspberry Pi uh, compute module so I'm really pleased that that's now got a place to live because it was just sat on top of there on a piece of cardboard so it didn't short out and I didn't quite like that so it's now got somewhere to live and um, the um, the next cube um, is going to I was thinking about putting some um, RGB LEDs I've got a whole bunch of these I got from the Liverpool Make Fest um, absolutely loads of them and I was thinking about maybe putting a few of these in the bottom and have them sort of glow and change colors just because why not I think a blue glow would make it look quite awesome there and the other thing I was doing was uh, playing around with Explorer to wire up for Tom's hardware so Explorer is this uh, cute little robot that I built a while ago that uses a Raspberry Pi Zero and the uh, Pimroni Explorer hat and you can then control the motors which are these um, N 20 motors um, and move this thing around so with it being a Raspberry Pi Zero or Zero Two um, I know that they can be quite rare some people have had quite a few issues getting hold of them but this was a really fun robot that I wanted to share with people and um, somebody was talking on uh, in, on social media about you know can this do speech recognition and voice recognition yes it can uh, we think we need to add an additional stack to the, uh, the top of it um, if I just go and grab one of these from in here there we go. I've got a bunch of these uh, re-speaker uh, headers uh, or hats 
And what these have on them is two microphones, They're like a left and a right microphone for getting really good audio and, uh, you know, um, getting rid of any uh, background sound. And they've also got um, a headphone jack on there as well so that you can uh, put an output to a speaker. Um, so this is a very simple thing to add to the to the sort of robot to give it a speech input and output. We did a video quite a long time ago on how to do speech recognition, voice synthesis uh, under the how to build your own AI in Python. And that can obviously run full Python as well, not just MicroPython. Um, so let's have a look what else people are talking about on there. Um, so that was the other builds that I did this week. Let me just go back over to my slides there. And go away. There we go. And if you're not on my Discord server, um, you can join that completely for free. Just go to action.smilesfan.com slash join dash Discord. And you can join in the conversation there with uh, all the other people that we've got on our Discord server. We talk almost exclusively about building robots, Raspberry Pi stuff, uh, 3D printing and so on. It's a really, really great community. And if you're not following me on social media, you can do that too. So on uh, Instagram, I think I'm kevinmaclear 28 and on Twitter, I'm KevsMac, that's KevsMac. And I do tweet, tweet every day and show work in progress uh, and show you kind of things that I'm currently working on or ideas that I might throw out there. But yeah, pretty much share everything I do there. <laughs> Okay, so if you want to help share, you know, help support the show, you can do a super thanks, which is on YouTube. You can do a super chat. And when we do the live QA, you can uh, press the super chat button to get your chat thing uh, boosted up there. Uh, and you can also go to buymeacoffee.com slash Kevin McAleer uh, and help um, to support the show. There is um, a YouTube membership button as well. I think you click join to do that. And that, again, um, just helps support the show. So why do you need to support the show? What's all that about, Kevin? Well, there is a lot of stuff I need to pay for every single week, uh, every month. There is the website hosting, there is the royalty-free music, there is graphic software like um, Canva and uh, Creative Cloud. Um, there's all the streaming software that I use to go live to you guys right now. So I use something called Ecamm Live, which is the best software for going live on a Mac. Um, and I also use Restream.io, which is like a restreaming uh, multicast thing. So it, it broadcasts to Facebook, to uh, Twitter, to Twitch, as well as to YouTube. And all the equipment that I use as well. So I've got all these different lights on here, the different cameras, um, all the different cameras that are going on there. Um, and obviously the Mac that I use too. So if you want to help with that, you can uh, you can go over to the, the buy me a coffee thing. That really helps me out. And I think that is everything I want to cover off in the content for the show. Yep, <laughs> that tells me that's my last slide. So this is the point in the video where if you're watching on replay, I'll say thank you very much for watching and I shall see you next time.